copy of God's Word, go ahead and find Psalm 24. That's where we're going to be spending our time today as we look to the King of Glory, as we get to behold the King of Glory together this afternoon. If you have kids with you, we have activity packs just right outside of these doors in those bags there. Feel free to go and grab those um, to give your kids something to do. Uh, Kids, thank you so much for being here. I am so thankful to see you guys in the room, and I love that you are here. Psalm 24, as we look at the King of glory. Now, let's begin by just admitting that glory is a funny thing. People find glory in the most unusual of places. Now, let me begin this story by saying our family loves Fiona the Hippo. We're big fans of Fiona the Hippo at the Kirkland House. But people find glory in the craziest of places. And if you are new to Cincinnati, maybe you don't know just how big of a deal this hometown hero of Fiona the Hippo is. Born in captivity at the Cincinnati Zoo, everybody loves Fiona. Well, whenever you go to the Cincinnati Zoo, you go to Hippo Cove, you know that there is always going to be one place that is extremely crowded, right? Everybody has their faces pressed to the glass. Everybody's on their tippy toes just trying to see a glimpse of this hippo that anytime we have been there is always really, really hard to find. I don't know if everybody experiences that the same way that we do. Well, there was a story two summers ago whenever we went there with our family. It was us. We had a couple of friends with us. And we're there. We wheel our stroller into Hippo Cove. Surprisingly, we find a place right by the glass and Fiona is nowhere to be found. So, so we're standing there just kind of waiting. You know, Brooks is, is sitting there in his stroller trying to see this hippo. And then this woman appears out of the corner of my eye, about 50 years old, dressed in hot pink from head to toe. Big Fiona the hippo on her shirt. She's got bright, hot pink, heart-shaped sunglasses to match her whole getup. And she's just kind of muttering Fiona facts into midair. Nobody's really talking to her. Nobody's listening. But this lady is obsessed with Fiona. She is there for the show that is Fiona. And then in a moment, right, the star jumps into the water. Fiona jumps in and this lady lets out a shriek, right? Just, ah! And then she pushes us out of the way, right? Here we are, just just an innocent little family. She pushes us out of the way. She knocks our friend Casey over to the side and she just lets out this shriek that Fiona is there. What was she doing? She was beholding the glory of a hippo. Right? P- people find glory in the strangest of places. Well, what does it mean to give glory, to behold glory? Well, when we give someone or something honor or value or recognition based upon who they are or what they have done, it is called giving glory. So glory is given to a hippo by a woman wearing heart-shaped sunglasses at the Cincinnati Zoo. But it is also given when a presidential candidate walks into a rally and everybody stands up and cheers. Glory is given when a meal that you eat becomes worthy of your Instagram before you even take a bite. Glory is given uh, when a band walks into a sold-out arena, when an athlete makes a highlight-worthy catch, when an updated version of the iPhone comes out and it's all that people can talk about. We make much of these people and these things Because you and I are hardwired to give glory. Have you ever stopped to ask, why do these things in that moment seem worthy of our glory, worthy of our recognition, our value, our praise? In some way, I think they tug on that part of our heart that reminds us that there is a bigger story than mine at work in the world. Oh, we love these moments because they promise a better life. They give us something to look forward to. They draw our attention away from the broken world that we live in. They offer a little bit of order in the midst of what feels like chaos. The the crazy catch that defies reality somehow lifts us out of the mundane of everyday life. These things seem to offer whatever it is that we think that we need. And for that reason, we give them glory. Now, don't get me wrong, we live in an enjoyable world that God has created and declared good, but only He is worthy of glory. And when we come to Psalm 24, we see King David beholding the King of glory. 
That's my main point this morning. That we would behold the King of glory. Now, I would love to talk about the vision of the Oaks over the next three months, fall calendar plans, whatever it is, but get this right. We are always and forever will be about worshiping and beholding the King of glory. And so I would do nothing else with the next 30 minutes than I have than to say, church, let's behold the King of glory. I need to. We need to. If you're like me, then you're far too often nearsighted. Your problems seem too big, and God often seems too small. We mindlessly scroll through pictures of people we don't know doing things that we don't care about. We are just looking for glorious things. And whenever we look for glorious things in this world, it will either leave us burdened, bored, or busy. Alliterated for your memory and just because I like to do it. Why are we burdened whenever we, whenever we look at the things of the world to, to be glorious for us? Well, we're burdened because it, he, or she didn't or doesn't live up to the hype of the glory we gave it, of the glory we gave them. Maybe we become bored. Why do we become bored whenever we put our glory in the wrong place? It's because you were made for more and you are settling for less. Whenever we put our glory in the wrong place, we get busy. Why? Because it feels better to be busy and try to do everything than to feel the instability of not beholding the one right thing. I'm hoping to bring you along with me this afternoon to the dusty streets of Israel. I want to behold the glory of King Jesus together. I want to behold a glory together that puts steel in my spine and cement under my feet. I want to behold a glory that draws me from the passivity that I often live in to living a life that has real, eternal purpose. In a world where I am daily reminded of my own limitations, I need to fix my eyes upon the God that has none. Let us behold the King of glory. As I said last week, it's always important for us to behold the occasion and the application of a psalm. So so whenever we get to Psalm 24 and we see here that this is a psalm of David, we need to ask ourselves, well, why did David write this psalm here? Well, many people believe that David wrote this psalm when the Ark of the Covenant was being brought back into the city of Jerusalem. Now, you may remember that the ark is the golden box that God told Moses to build. So not Noah's ark, right? This is a different ark. This is the ark of the covenant relationship of God. So uh, kids, think of kind of a big golden box that's the size of your dinner table. That's what the ark of the covenant looked like. Now, it was significant both because of what it contained and what it symbolized. In this box, you had the tablets of the Ten Commandments, which represented God's relationship with his people. It also had the staff of the priest Aaron uh, to represent the way that God led his people. It also contained a jar of manna. That flaky bread was in this Ark of the Covenant, Um, not because they were using it as some overly sized lunchbox, but because it was a reminder of the way that God provided for his people. And so this represented the relationship that God had with his people. And on top of this box, the lid had these two angels that faced one another. And in that place, on top of the box, it was called the mercy seat. And this is where they would shed the blood of a sacrifice that represented the way that God forgave the people of his, forgave the people of their sins so that he could have a relationship with them when they broke the commands so that he could lead them even though they were hard to lead and so that he would provide for them even though they often looked for provision in places other than him. You see, this belonged in the most sacred place of the tabernacle because it represented the place that God would dwell among his people, would be with his people. So the Ark of the Covenant was extremely significant. And when it was where it belonged in the tabernacle, a cloud would rest upon the tent and everyone in the city would know God is with us. But there came a terrible day in the life of Israel that the ark was no longer in the tabernacle. In 1 Samuel 3, we read the story of a very unsuccessful battle for Israel. See, Israel went up against the Philistines and they suffered defeat. And it was bad. 
And so their pride was hurt. And instead of praying about the battle or seeking God's counsel about what to do next, they come up with a terrible, horrible idea. They decided, hey, we'll just face the Philistines again. But this time, they carried in the Ark of the Covenant just as a good luck charm to help them win. Well, things quickly went south. It was a terrible battle. 30,000 soldiers were killed, and the Ark was captured and stolen by the Philistines. The Ark was gone. The place that represented God's presence was gone. See, the story of what happened to the Philistines when they had the ark is a good one, and it's worth telling, but maybe for another day. The Philistines, they suffered by having the ark, and so they found a way to just get it out of their city. They strapped it to some cows, let it go, right? They had to get it out of there. And then it sat in a place called Kiriath Jerim for 20 years. 1 Samuel 7 2 tells us that the house of Israel lamented after the Lord because the ark was gone. For two decades, the ark was gone. And there was a lot to be upset about in Israel at this time. The people thought that a king would help, so they chose Saul. Saul turned out to be a bad king. And then a better king came along. David took the throne of Israel. But he knew that things would not be right until the ark was back within the city. He sends his men to retrieve the ark of the presence of God. And as it enters the city, he sings these words that we find in verse 7. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, He is the King of glory. David was overwhelmed with praise, and we should be too. See, the presence of God was was made known among men again. And although David wrote this psalm roughly 1,000 years before Jesus came to earth, this both foreshadows the coming of Christ and is fulfilled by our King Jesus. You see, David longed to behold the glory of God. And as we stand on this side of the cross, we are reminded of the words of Paul when he says, For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You see, to behold the glory of God, we have to look no further than our King Jesus And so as we come to this psalm, we're going to see three sections here that describe our King Jesus. And we're going to behold Him this morning. And I think if we behold Him correctly, it will change everything about our lives. First, let's look at verses 1 and 2. We read, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For He has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. The first thing that I want you to see and behold about the King of glory is that our King rules all of creation. Our King rules all of creation. Our God, the King of glory, is the creator of all things. David, expressing the immeasurable greatness of God here, observes the signature of God on all that he has made. From the tiniest grains of sand to the grandest of canyons, God is the author author of it all. And I think we often downplay how glorious this really is. You see, whenever we think about someone like Jeff Bezos, who is the owner and founder of Amazon.com, it's easy to be overwhelmed by all that he owns, isn't it? Uh, We hear that that he has got money and companies and real estate, etc., that his net worth is $188.5 billion. That means if you do the math, he is roughly making $321 million dollars a day. Whenever we look at his portfolio, we just can't imagine someone who, who owns companies like Whole Foods and the Washington Post, Uber, Twitter, the list goes on. And yet David reflects on the authorship and ownership of the God who is the creator and owner of all things. And it makes someone like Bezos look poor and impoverished. He says, God's portfolio is immeasurable. Mountains, stars, planets, galaxies. 
animals. God owns it all. His signature is on everything. God can look at every single thing that he has made and say, mine. Not only does he own it, he created it. Ex nihilo, which is a theological way of saying God simply spoke and nothing became something. That's the kind of authority that God has as creator. He is so powerful that the thin airs became Swiss Alps because he said so. God is creator. The pagan gods of David's time were imaginary and false. And yet, even as figments of people's imaginations, they weren't given this kind of power. Have you ever thought about that? They each just had spheres of influence. So maybe one of these false gods got to be the god of the sun, another the god of fertility. Maybe one could be over your health while you had to carve another one to be over your home. And yet David beholds the one true and living king of glory that rules the fullness of it all. And like we sang as children, he has the whole world in his hand. We get to verse 2 and read that he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Here David proclaims that God has founded the earth upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. And I want you to remember here that David is not writing as a scientist. David is writing as a worshiping poet. His desire is not to explain to us how the earth and the oceans interact, but to make much of the God who created them both. You see, in the time period of David's writing, the oceans and the rivers were viewed as unpredictable and dangerous. The currents were swift, waves couldn't be figured out, and much was unknown. So here David magnified the power of God among the pagan nations by proclaiming that the king of glory subdues the water and establishes the earth. He brings order out of chaos and commands the waves. What does this mean for you? I hope that verses 1 and 2 would lead you to behold both the massive and meticulous sovereignty of God. You see, God's control of all things is massive and limitless, and yet it is unbelievably meticulous and personal to His people. See, God's sovereignty is so massive that he owns and commands every sea, every star in the sky, and every animal that roams the earth, but it is so meticulous that the Red Sea is parted when his people need a path, that the sun stands still when Joshua needs more light, and that a den of lions can become as safe as a daycare because Daniel prayed. See, God's sovereignty is both massive and meticulously mindful of his people. Some of you are starting school tomorrow. Maybe you're becoming a parent for the first time, or you became one a while back and you're still trying to figure it out. Maybe you're living in a pandemic like the rest of us. You're worried about your aging parents or whatever it is. But we can behold our king who rules over all creation and give these cares into his sovereign Hands As John Newton once prayed, Thou art coming to a king. Large petitions and prayers would thee bring. For his grace and power are such that none can ever ask too much. We behold the glory of our king because he's the creator and owner of everything. The second thing I want you to see about God in this passage is that our king is holy and kind. Our king is holy and kind. Look at verse 3. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Selah. See, we were made for fellowship with this God. The cry of David's heart in this psalm is to enjoy the presence of God. He wants to know Him. He wants to be near Him. And yet he asks, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who can dwell in God's presence? Let me ask, is this question even on your mind? Whatever you think about the sin in your heart, is this question even on your mind? How do I know God? How do I be in the presence of God? See, most people aren't thinking about this. And perhaps there are two reasons that this question often isn't on our radar. I think one, because we forget how good and glorious God is. Perhaps you don't know how good and glorious God is. 
We often get so preoccupied with trivial things, our priorities are all mixed up. Do we get too busy to behold God? Perhaps the second reason we're not asking this question is because we don't realize how serious our sin actually is. We don't view our daily disobedience as treason against the creator of the universe. We dull this sober reality that our wickedness is actually rebellion against a holy God. We just kind of label it as white lies or, or a struggle or a bad habit and forget that our king is holy. See, God describes himself as a consuming fire. Now, let's say that you're grilling one afternoon and you're standing there over the grill and you're eating the first cheeseburger that came off of it. And, and as you're eating that cheeseburger, a, a drop of ketchup just kind of drips onto your shirt. Well, what happens? That drop of ketchup becomes a stain. You've got to wash it out later, you know, maybe shout it out. I don't know. But if that same drop of ketchup falls onto the grill, what happens? It is immediately evaporated by those glowing coals. What God is saying whenever he says that he is holy like a consuming fire is that he wants us to know that our sinful hearts are like a drop of ketchup falling onto a glowing coal in the presence of a holy God. And David had a story to prove it. You see, I don't, I don't know about you, but anytime we've moved, I feel like something typically goes wrong. Well, apparently it was the same in the Old Testament. Moving day came along. It was time to bring the ark into the city, and something goes wrong. When they were transporting the ark into Jerusalem, it kind of began to shift. It was about to fall, and a man named Uzzah reached out to just kind of steady the ark, and immediately he drops dead. Why? Because you don't just casually touch the presence of God. You see, David w heard this story. This just happened. And so David is writing this psalm saying, who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Who can stand in your holy place? He asks because he already knows the answer. It is those who have clean hands and a pure heart. Those that don't lift up their souls to what is false and swear deceitfully. And do you feel that? If you were to hold the word of God just kind of as an x-ray machine over your soul right now, how are you doing? Man, I come to this, and, it, and unless the gospel gives me hope, I am, I'm just stuck right here. You see, if we were to read these verses isolated from the rest of this song, there would be empty of any hope for us. You see, we're unworthy to be in the presence of God. Our hands are not pure. Regardless of how much hand sanitizer you have used today, your hands are not pure enough to be in the presence of God. You can't clean up your hands. What does David mean here? This phrase symbolizes our own actions. Our hands are dirty when we stand before a holy God and our actions condemn us. But even if we could keep up our appearances and act in a way that is pleasing to God, it still wouldn't be enough. Why? Because he says you need a pure heart. God is so holy that he cannot even accept our mixed motives or our tendency to often just do the right things for the wrong reasons. You see, if we have to be clean, pure, internally and externally, and not only that, he goes on to say that we also can't lift up our souls to anything else, that we can't speak deceitfully. I want you to see that as David writes this, he knows he doesn't meet this standard, and neither do we. Picture David beholding the, the glory of God and then being almost like a child entering a theme park just full of excitement, overwhelmed with a joy, running to the roller coaster to get there and to see the measuring stick only to find that he's not tall enough to get in. You see, he, he shows us that the problem is not our height. The problem is our heart. So who shall ascend this hill? Well, David undoubtedly has that treacherous hill going up to Jerusalem in mind as he writes this because Three times a year, everybody would come for Jewish festivals and they would ascend this hill of the Lord. You see, the physical mountain was difficult to climb, but the spiritual one was impossible. Who can ascend the holy hill of God? We come to this passage and understand that it won't be climbed with hiking boots or willpower. We can't climb into the presence of God in our own effort. And it is in this moment of desperation that the gospel actually becomes good news. 
You see, the holy hill of God is not a mountain of morality that you can hike. It's not a path of personal performance that you can work your way up. It isn't a religious staircase of rituals and sacrifices. You can't climb into the hill of God's holy presence. But you can be carried there. You have to be carried there. To know Christ, to trust in Him, is to be carried into the presence of God. And this is grace. You see, the gospel is the good news that God didn't just provide a way for us to be in His presence, but that in His kindness, He came to us. Jesus, our King, stepped into His creation. He set aside the robes of heaven to take upon the restraint of humanity. He lived every moment of His earthly life with clean hands and a pure heart so that He alone could ascend a hill called Calvary and have His pure hands pierced by lawless men. Then he rose to ascend the holy hill of God. Come before the Father and say of everyone who believes, they are with me. They are clean. They are pure. And they have put their soul's hope in one who is not false, but in one who is true, good. And for that reason, we behold the King of glory. This is why David describes the one that enters the presence of God in verse 5 as the one who will receive blessing and righteousness from the Lord, the God of our salvation. It is received, not worked for. Everything we have comes from God. He is our source of righteousness. He makes us right with God. He is the God of our salvation. I want you to see here that ascending the hill of God is like getting on a ski lift. Now, the only way for it to work is for you to completely rest in the work of another. And this is what it means for us to say that the gospel is Jesus in my place. So where do you find yourself this afternoon? Are you trying to scrub your hands clean because of some failure or fault you had this week? Are you trying to hike up the hill of holiness to impress others or even to impress God? Only Jesus can bring you to the top of this holy mountain. And from there, everything about your perspective changes. The whole world looks different. See, beholding your king who is holy and kind is the only thing that will give you the hope of real change. I know I I preach the gospel of grace and some of you are saying, no, 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 no. You need to talk about being holy more. You need to talk about what we do more. And what I want you to see is that the only way that your behavior will ever change is if you behold the King who is glorious. You see, whenever you take your eyes off Christ and try to become better, one of two things will happen. You will terribly fail in your pursuit of a clean hand and a pure heart, and you will sink into despair. And in that moment, nothing feels glorious to you. Or... You will make some meager progress in becoming a better person and changing some of your bad habits. And you will become so prideful, self-righteous, and condescending that you will be in a worse place than when you started. And in that moment, you become a thief of the glory that God deserves. But when we hold the, the King who, who is glorious, whenever we behold Him, everything else will fall into place. Did you notice in verse 6 how God describes Himself as the God of Jacob? Now, if you've read the book of Genesis, then you know that Jacob got a name change. The name Jacob means hill grabber or trickster, and Jacob lived up to that in every sense of the word. He was a sinner in every way. He was deceptive and manipulative. But one day, what happened? God changed Jacob's name to Israel. And I think that David is reminding us here of God's transforming grace whenever he uses Israel's old name, Jacob. Maybe you come here this afternoon and you are a Jacob wrestling with God and no real relationship. Maybe you've had some moment of weakness or forgetfulness in the past week and you lived like a Jacob. But we have the great hope that our king is kind enough to call himself the God of Jacob. He invites thieves and prostitutes to dine at his table. His kingdom is open to the hypocrite and the hurting. And guess what? There are seats for us too. So who shall ascend this holy hill? Those who tremble at the weight of his holiness, but trust in the kindness of his grace. 
Or as the Apostle Paul would tell the church in Rome, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And this is a good reminder to us, right, that only God dwells on a holy hill. Because one of the biggest obstacles to genuine community and unity within our church will be forgetting this. Because we often place ourselves on a holy hill where we look down upon others or perhaps we think too much of other people and set expectations they could never meet. We place them on a holy hill that they do not deserve. But when we come as those who are seeking the face of God as the generation of Jacob, we acknowledge that we are all sinners seeking the face of God, and then we will truly be able to love one another, absorb each other's faults, and fight for the family that Jesus died for. And if we can do that, we will reach this whole city for Christ. If we can do that, we will show the city of Cincinnati a love that cannot be found anywhere else. If we behold the glory of God in our King Christ, then we have a hope to offer the world because our King is both holy and and kind, but often it gets just too messy to pursue this kind of love in Christian community. Let's fight for it. The third thing I want you to see about our king is that our king is the king of glory. Verses 7 through 10. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Selah. Our king is the king of glory. The third thing I want you to see about him. You see, the final section of this psalm is the moment in which the king of glory enters the city. David personifies the architecture of the city of Israel. He commands the gates to lift up their heads. He swings open the doors that the king of glory may come in. The streets were alive with shouts of praise. The story of David's joy and celebration in 2 Samuel 6 shows David overcome with gladness, dancing so much that his wife becomes embarrassed and indignant at the way that he's acting. She scoffed him because he was just wearing his linen clothes instead of wearing his royal robes. She didn't understand that this day was about a much better king, the king of glory. See, David knew that beholding the king of glory would give him an accurate sense of self-awareness. David was powerful. He, He commanded armies and governed the land. David was handsome. He is described as ruddy, which is a Hebrew Old Testament way of saying this dude would have been on the cover of GQ. I can't tell if you guys are smiling or laughing. You got masks on, whatever. He he was rich. There was nothing that he wanted that he could not afford. Think about that. He was smart. He, He knew how to play multiple instruments. He was a master of literature and poetry. And as the cool kids say, David recognized real because real recognized real. And what happens? David's recognition of God's superiority didn't drive him into sulking or jealousy. It drove him to humble worship because he was blown away at the fact that the king of glory who rules over all creation cared for him. When was the last time that you were overwhelmed by that truth? We get to verse 8 and we see that this psalm is structured in such a way that two choirs would sing in a dialogue of call and response. Picture it, a sea of people cry out from one side of the city gates, who is this king of glory? The other choir responds, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. It was customary in this time period for a war to take place outside of the city walls. And now while the soldiers were off in battle, those who remained in the city would be confronted with the fact that their fate hung in the balance of whatever was going on outside. You see, the next person to walk through those city gates would either be an opposing king whose desire was to plunder the city and to take captive all of its residents, or it would be their king who would enter and declare that they were safe and secure. You see, the city of God's people cry out in praise because our God is victorious. He is strong and mighty in battle. Perhaps the best earthly example of this kind of celebration is when a team returns to their city 
after winning the Super Bowl. We'll probably know what that's like next year. The Kansas City Chiefs, right, at the beginning of this year, came home to hundreds of thousands of fans wearing red and gold, chanting their names. Imagine that kind of celebration. People of every age, color, and economic status united around the victory of another. That is what it is like to worship the King. In verse 9, we see that the choirs repeat their commands. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. And then the question is asked, who is this King of glory? Church, we know the answer. The King of glory is Jesus. And yet this King set aside His glory for us. Who is this that steps into the world that He created? He is the King of glory. Who is this? The child born in a stable, surrounded by animals and shepherds. He is the king of glory. Who is this man that speaks and preaches with authority? He is the king of glory. Who is this that makes the lame to walk and the blind to see, the deaf to hear, and the mute to speak? Who is this that wakes corpses with the sound of his voice? He is the king of glory. Who welcomes sinners and restores the broken? He is the king of glory. Who is this that is beaten and bleeding? He's the king of glory. Who is this nailed to the cross and bearing my guilt? He is the king of glory. Who is this placed in a borrowed tomb for three days? He's the king of glory. Who is this? that makes the ground to shake, guards tremble, and takes up his life to live again. He is the king of glory who rolls away a rock that he created with his own voice. The king of glory. He ascends in glories. The angels roar. It is the Lord strong and mighty in battle. Who is this king of glory? It is Jesus the Christ. He is the name above every name. He is the king of kings and Lord of lords. Nations bow before him and all creation sings his praise. Behold, the King of glory. And we rejoice as Israel did. Not because He has entered a city, but because He has chosen to enter the lives of sinners like you and me. How does it, how does it look for us to behold the King of glory this week? Let me give you two truths that I think will help us as we seek to behold this King of glory. First, because Jesus owns everything, anything can be an opportunity to worship Him. How do we behold the King? Anything can be an opportunity to worship Him because Jesus owns everything. The sacred and secular divide is a myth. See, Paul quoted this psalm when he told the church in Corinth to do all things to the glory of God. So whether you eat or drink, this means that by God's grace, I can date my wife, do my job, and play with my sons in the living room to the glory of God. Yes, may we always gather as a church family to sit under the word preached and to sing songs to the praise of our King. But let us also be those who take every thought captive and worship God with every square inch of our lives. Imagine a church that believes this, that believes anything can be an opportunity to glorify God. It would change the way that teachers view their students, that doctors care for their patients, and students manage their time. It gives eternal purpose to every part of our day. We would have a different perspective. We would seek opportunities to bless others. We would find ways to work the gospel into everyday conversations. We would stress less and pray more. Our homes, cars, offices, and classrooms would become places that we are aware of the presence of God and we behold His glory. And the second thing that I invite you to do this week to behold the glory of God is to realize that entering and enjoying the kingdom of God is more about beholding than behaving. I want to invite you to behold God this week. I want you to understand that just because you have entered this room doesn't mean that you have entered a relationship with God, and yet He is inviting you to ascend this holy hill through the name of Christ. You see, what you behold will always shape how you behave. So let me ask, is He your King? What is on the throne of your heart this afternoon? What is fighting for the glory of God? 
You see, the way that you live does matter. Holiness matters. And as those that have been purchased by Christ, we should seek to grow in our purity. But what I want you to understand first and foremost is that entering the kingdom, if you are not yet a Christian, and enjoying the kingdom of God, if you are a Christian, is more about beholding Jesus than behaving better. And when you really behold God, behaving differently will come naturally. I want you to enjoy God. I want you to really enjoy Him. I want you to crave to hear His voice in His Word. I want you to be those who, while you're mowing the lawn or cooking dinner, you you want to listen to a podcast or a sermon that reveals more of God to you. I want you to read good books, to dive deeper with other believers that have different spiritual strengths and knowledge of God than you do so that you can pursue God, behold Him. And as you behold God in this way, the Holy Spirit at work within you will bring about the change you desire. See, as we come this morning this afternoon, seeking to behold the glory of God. I want you to know that if you are looking for greatness, you won't find it behind the glass at the Cincinnati Zoo. You will find it by beholding the King of glory. Let's pray. Jesus, you are the King of glory. Jesus, we admit that that so often in our lives, even in the past day, we're, we're so tempted to look other places for glory God, may we seek you. God, may we be in awe of who you are. God, may we be overwhelmed by your kindness and your mercy toward us. Lord, I pray that if there are those here who would say, I can't ascend the holy hill, God, that they would trust in the work of Christ, that they would confess their sins before you and trust in Jesus as Savior. Lord, I pray for those of us who are so often distracted, God, that we would have a view of you that sends us to love others in this room, that makes us speak to a world that doesn't know you, and drives us with a motivation that we only love because you first loved us. And we pray this in Christ's name.